welcome back we are now at uh, part 3 of module 3 in this part we will uh, look at various uh, bilingual memory models as in what is the relationship of uh, language uh, in terms of bilingualism uh, with respect to memory human uh, human memory system what are the different uh, ways of understanding this what are the uh, various parts of uh, this uh, interaction what are the various models that is what we will look at so a quick recap here where have we reached so far so we have seen that uh, language acquisition can be of different types successive and simultaneous so two different kinds of uh, second language acquisition is possible and keeping in mind the type of acquisition it has been the nature of that second language representation can also be different there are different patterns of learning different patterns of usage and so on so there are lots of differences in terms of the type of second language acquisition or type of bilingualism uh, bilingual acquisition that has been that has taken place now once that learning has taken place we have already looked at the learning part now what happens after that once we have learned this entire knowledge system goes and sits down somewhere right so it's it needs to be stored in some sense so this information about the language must be stored in some place so this what what will this storage include this will include a lot of things lot of information for example it will include um, structural information it will include conceptual information pragmatic information and so on so we have seen already structurally we mean the grammatical information or the lexical information and how the uh, words come, can combine and so on conceptual of course leads to the uh, mental uh, uh, representation of the meaning aspect of language and then of course pragmatic information pragmatic information about the usage so all of these different types of information is what we actually acquire when we say i have acquired a second language or a third language this is what we acquire this is the uh, if we break it down to into its parts these are the things that we acquire and once we have acquired it it goes and sits sits in a place there is a something something uh, of a storage system there now once it has gone there once it has been stored in a particular place we of course it is not that it goes and uh, we forget about it so the way it is stored is very crucial right how it is stored and how we can access that information whenever we need so when in a bilingual scenario when we code switch and code mix all the time what happens is that all this all these uh, parallel information are stored and we can go back and forth between them all the time so we we access that information in the course of a conversation so this access to the that storage should be uh, needs to be understood in a very uh, well defined manner and then not only we access we also use them so process them why do we need to access we need to access that information for two things one is when we understand or comprehend somebody else speaking second when we speak ourselves so both for comprehension as well as production or articulation as we are more familiar with both of these kinds of processes needs to access the storage information so this entire background basically now takes us to what is called bilingual memory storage we have already seen that bilingual storage should include the structural information conceptual information pragmatic information and it will the same same kind of uh, information which should be needed for both the languages and if there are three languages similarly another language so bilingual memory storage how it is accessed and how it is processed this is where we are now and this is where our journey begins today so memory before we get into bilingual memory let us um, quickly understand human memory system to uh, uh, in very brief so memory is something that we all are the word we are all familiar with for example i have um, uh, written here the familiar a familiar smell a flower or something any any a very small trigger can bring back you know deluge of memories from your past from your childhood from a particular incident that must have happened somewhere or you know all these kinds of things we are very familiar with it so what it basically happens uh, what it basically means is that for example a familiar smell may trigger an entire event 
or even an entire period of your childhood or not necessarily childhood by another time in your life uh, let's say 10 years back right so this is what we mean by memory so this particular trigger takes us back to uh, the storage system where we have kept all our memories intact so that is what uh, it awakens it awakens memory and in terms of in scientific term we call this long term memory long term memory is a memory uh, part of the memory system that has been that is more of a storage system as we will see shortly or more precisely we call this explicit memory. So you see already we are beginning to complicate things, memory is not just one thing, there are memories that is not a one memory. So turns out there are memories and not just a memory, okay. So theoretically uh, in terms of psychology, cognitive psychology, uh, there are broad distinction between how many types of memories we have, what are the you know the, the smaller aspects of it and so on. So broad distinctions are between two, the short term memory and the long term memory. And long term memory has even further divisions, declarative versus non-declarative memory. So we already have seen that there are two kinds of memory system, one is long term memory that I was just mentioning, the things that have been you know that we have kept on adding up and uh, that is a big storage of things, information and uh, that includes all hours of information and experiences that is, long, that is long term memory and short term memory is short term memory. We will see uh, shortly what it is. So this is a simplistic representation of the human memory system as we have just uh, said. So there is memory and it has two broad distinctions between short term and long term and then long term again has um, explicit and implicit and again they have their own uh, divisions. A good, good way of understanding memory is um, let us say the banking system. All of us have bank accounts. So there are two at least two kinds of deposits that you have. One is what we call the savings account and another is typically what you call term deposit, recurring deposit, various kinds of deposits. Now what happens in deposits is various types of deposits you keep adding money to that. So that is a storage of money that is there and that of course increases over a period of time in interests and this and that. So that is a corpus sort of, sort of so to say. On the other hand you have a savings account. Savings account is typically what we all the time use for our daily expenses, paying the bills to um, buying vegetables and so on and so forth. So that is let us call this the short term memory. This is something that is being used all the time. It is here and now. Right, this is this is the one that is at your hand all the time. Long term memory is some, somewhat like those deposits that is there. That is there and over a period of time various kinds of interests depending on how many types of deposits you have, different kinds of interest will accumulate and that will you know get into diverse, uh, it will be diversified into various types of long term deposits. So this is somewhat like that, it is easier to understand in this way. Now long term memory again has like explicit versus implicit um, memory and then explicit has episodic and semantic and then implicit has priming and procedural. So the distinction between these two types of memory systems it goes back a long way, pretty long way you, as we see uh, it started with James uh, 1890 in the um, writing where he first distinguishes between the memory systems into he calls them primary memory and secondary memory. So the primary memory is for recent experiences, something happened that happened just 2 hours back, something that happened half an hour back that is primary memory, hmm? recent experiences and secondary memory he calls for, for information stored over a very long period, over a long period from your childhood till today the kind of information you might have stored uh, somewhere back of your mind is what, uh, what the secondary memory was. Later, much later actually as you see in 1960s was the time when cognitive psychology as a new field was um, shaping up and this is when um, this uh, field was looking at human minds information processing system as in how do we process information in what are the different types of interaction that information has with the uh, storage system and so on. So this brought the memory system again into uh, focus. So uh, this primary we owe it to Nazer 1967. Nazer uh, who looked at this for this particular uh, aspect in a new way starting with co in a cognitive psychology uh, perspective. And then 
as a result a lot of new studies new um, areas emerged and new new way of trying to understand the human memory system also started around in 1968 most of the memory models go back to atkinson's uh, and shifrin's 1968 model of the human memory system uh, and then he, he called it as opposed to the as opposed to james he called them short term memory and long term memory this is short term memory and this is long term memory so he called them short term memory which he was he, um, uh, james called uh, primary and secondary became long term memory but the idea remains the same most of today's memory models go back to atkinson and shifrin's model uh, though there have been many changes many new additions and uh, uh, readjustments of various things but the basic model still remains indebted to this 1968 model now one might think what made them actually go for this kind of a division why why uh, do we really need two kinds of memories turns out there were a lot of research around uh, late 60s and um, there were a lot of research specifically on amnesia showed that uh, in amnesia what happens that there is you know one kind of memory can selectively get disrupted this is what the findings of that time showed and as a result this gave a lot of evidence uh, there were many studies um, two most well known ones are um, uh, this one Badlis and and uh, Warrington 70 and Milner 66 uh, there are many others also so they found out that in case of amnesia it is not necessary that entire memory system will be disturbed at the same time there is there is a possibility of one kind of memory getting selectively disrupted and this is what gave a lot of uh, you can say incentive to studying the memory system in terms of two types of memory storage again now that we already have long term memory short term memory all of these things in place let's look at them as slightly uh, in slightly more detail so long term memory has as we have already seen declarative or uh, it is also called explicit memory and there is non declarative or implicit memory now a declarative memory this storage is basically about the information about any event or anything for that matter any kind of thing including language so that as many many papers have many books have called it that part of the information so what happened after that what happened how did you feel about that where did it happen so the information structure about various events that is what goes into declarative memory and now declarative memory has two kinds again there is epi episodic memory and there is semantic memory we will see uh, each of them uh, one by one now uh, episodic memory and semantic memory were considered to be uh, different and bifurcated um, however recent findings show that there probably is a lot more of give and take between these two than we previously thought but nonetheless there the, there are still some differences that uh, remain and we will see that then we have non declarative or implicit memory implicit memory is more focused on procedural memory so how the things happened the processes that were part of that that information so what goes into declarative how goes into the non declarative part so this is concerned with information about how things work the processes thereof and so on and also information that are processed through uh, learned through conditioning of various types right so those uh, priming and conditioning this kind of uh, methods when you learn something through these methods that information goes into our implicit memory now there are some uh, interesting differences that have come up uh, of late now there is one interesting difference comes from the neural uh, uh, components so it explicit and implicit memories have different distinct neural uh, components these are the recent comparatively recent findings uh, this should be 2008 um also they play in the distinct roles in terms of language acquisition and processing so we are more interested in a uh, language so in terms of language acquisition both acquisition and processing the different types of memory like declarative versus the non declarative also have distinct roles 
So, explicit memory can be uh, in terms of language it can be demonstrated when we verbally recount something as you as you narrate something that this happened and then there is a whole narration verbally. So, this this is the connection between uh, it can be verbally explicitly demonstrated answering a question and this is also why a lot of bilingual cognition research actually has been focusing on the explicit memory both semantic and episodic. On the other hand uh, implicit memory uh, remember we talked about conditioning learning through conditioning. So, that is where the learning of grammar comes in. So, acquisition of grammar has been uh, often attributed to implicit memory. So, this is basically because implicit the very name suggests that it is not explicit you cannot see it it is more difficult to, uh, uh, to demonstrate right. So, how do we see how do we judge how do we uh, check or uh, experimentally speaking how do we uh, evaluate implicit uh, memory typically through non-conscious change in performance. So, there are experiments that are designed to check over a period of time uh, as to how new knowledge has uh, made has translated into differential performance over the same task. So, that is how implicit memory is typically checked. Right. So, we have already now the basics in place uh, declarative versus non-declarative and now we will see within the declarative memory as we have already mentioned that episodic and semantic memory are the two types within declarative memory and both of these are heavily st studied. Um, there is a lot of research going on in terms of um, each of these uh, memory systems contribution to language uh, acquisition function processing so on and how are they uh, what are the interactions between them. So, episodic memory is the highly specialized memory about specific time related events. Uh, memory for events and personal experiences. So, episodic memory more often than not talks about the uh, entire uh, gamut of information that you might have about a particular event in the past. Now, this event in more more often than not has a personal nature to it is subjective, subjective information something like your childhood, you know the kind of school you went to what all happened there. This is this entire gamut of information is part of what we call uh, episodic memory. In fact, uh, there is uh, one aspect of episodic memory which is called autobiographical memory uh, that is also there. Um, but we are not going into all of that details. The basic idea is that episodic memory deals mainly with a person's uh, individual unique experiences and that is why each person's episodic memory could be different from uh, the other person. So, it also includes specific details about the event, time, place and the context and the emotions and so on. So, first time when you learn to drive what happened, first time when you had a new cycle what happened. Uh, this this is not the same for one uh, for everybody there are different kinds of different layers of emotions and contextual information are there. So, that is all of them go to episodic memory. Semantic memory on the other hand is more objective knowledge about the world both are different types of knowledge subjective knowledge is also kind of knowledge. Semantic memory talks about objective knowledge things that are there in the world right. So, world knowledge encyclopedic knowledge. Uh, knowledge of language, knowledge about objects and so on. For example, Chennai is the capital of Tamil Nadu that information is objective information that is that is true for everybody. It is not subjective. So, sim similar things they all go into semantic memory. So, this is as a result not a personal story, this is not a personal unique uh, memory story, this is something quite common for everyone. So, this is the primary difference between uh, episodic verse and semantic memory. So, let us go at slightly more into detail um, what we have already said. So, this contains information stored uh, that has some kind of a marker for uh, when the event was originally encountered. So, all the markers actually markers about what we mean by marker, marker is all the pointers. So, the, the people involved the, in the, the event itself, the context of the event, the emotions that were felt and you know what happened after that all of that. So, personal experiences in the past exist in subjective time and space and requires a conscious recollection and controlled process. Okay. So, this is a conscious part of it uh, that is why this is part of explicit memory and it needs a controlled uh, access to it. So, basically it contains the records of unique events which anybody, any individual 
encountered in, dip in, in a particular time. So, uh, and as I had just mentioned, autobiographical memories are also part of the episodic memory. Now, we will go to semantic memory. Semantic memory is thought to store general information as we have just seen. It can be about uh, facts of the world, information about various things, for example, the, the parts of a computer, for example, or the screen, for example, that the knowledge about this exists already. It does not depend on personal uh, interpretation, nobody, no individual's interpretation is uh, important there. So, it exists as world knowledge. So, that kind of information, information about language, uh, all of that goes into. So, it is a kind of a mental dictionary okay, containing all the attributes of event free knowledge. So, what does event free knowledge mean? that this is objective, this exists even without anybody else's interpretation or uh, having anything to do with time, space, person, nothing, no context, it is uh, context free information. So, some of these are like this, these are all context free information, they remain true what, wherever they are. Now, the relationship between semantic memory and uh, second language acquisition has been studied given various kinds of parameters. So, one of them is that uh, they have shown that learning a second language or knowing a second language extends semantic memory and other co cognitive capabilities because primarily because they recruit various kinds of cognitive operations. We will see them towards the end of the course when we talk about the uh, result of or the effect of speaking more than one language, what are the cognitive effects that is. So, that, that is where we will come back to it uh, in more detail. Now, let us go on go to short term memory. Now, short term memory is as I said the savings account that is something you are using all the time and that is that is exactly where a lot of our language processing also happens. So, things that are part of our con in a conversation for example, there are two, three conversation partners. So, I have to uh, anybody who is talking in that context must keep in mind the other person's point of view, the, the facts and you know objectives stated by the other person in order to incorporate them in my part of the conversation. So, that is, so we are constantly updating and uh, uh, recalibrating basically to our, our own understanding, our processing, be it comprehension, be it production. So, that bit of language processing is dependent on short term memory. So, short term memory uh, is a part of um, what is called working memory. Sometimes short term memory and working memory are used um, interchangeably, however, there are subtle differences. Now, uh, working memory also includes attentional and control units and that is why it has uh, become a rather interesting domain of study um, as to how uh, language attention and control mechanisms are connected and how they can be, how they manipulate one another. These are uh, uh, again this is another domain that uh, that I have discussed in my uh, in another uh, course. So, this is what brings us to short term memory and information from long term memory is transferred to so this is something like a transit house sort of a thing. So, information that are there in long term memory are shifted to short term memory to be processed given a particular kind of a task or condition or, or whatever kind of context. Similarly, information that you are collecting through your sensory uh, apparatus for the uh, initially are stored in the short term memory and gradually they are uh, shifted to long term memory. So, that is what basically short term memory and long term memory connection is. So, this temporarily stores and processes information during mental operations. Either uh, we are using when whatever information we are using right now is considered to be present in the STM part. But if you do not need them, then they are uh, pushed back to uh, LTM. So, that is what the working memory holds information for a short duration during which it retains all the tools needed at that time to perform an action or make a decision. So, this is not only about language, but about any other kind of action. And this is the place where also where conscious thinking uh, takes place. Now, in terms of language, a major function of the working memory system is um, the retention and processing of verbal information as I was just mentioning. Now, bilingual performance and working memory tasks can be affected by various factors. So, um, language dominance, language proficiency and the nature of the task. Let us just um, uh, stop here and let us see what we mean by language dominance. 
for example, a bilingual who has uh, learned the second language much later, we have already seen that if you learn, learn your second language in childhood versus in adulthood, there are differences in your uh, language competence, the how well you have learned the language. Now another angle to this is the idea of language dominance. What happens is earlier the uh, belief that was held was that L1 that is the first language is the stronger language. It also has larger vocabulary, you are more proficient in it, you are and also the L1 dominates L2 because your L1 most probably will be the one that you are using most of the time. L2 has a shorter domain of usage and that is the idea of dominance. So, what which language dominates your daily usage? However, that may not be always true. Often what happens, you change the context, you change the uh, lifestyle of a person, let us say one moves from rural to uh, the urban setup or you know, you name it in, in a small town from a to a cosmopolitan town and so on, what happens is that chances are very high your L2 might be dominant. For example, many of us um, hardly get to use our first language. So more of, most of the time we will be using because the work condition uh, demands that we use English most of the time. So as a result, it is quite possible that based on context, based on various other factors, lifestyle factors, L, either L1 or L2 could be dominant language. So, that is a very important um, aspect uh, that uh, shows its impact on language processing, that is the idea of language dominance. So, just because um, the L1 was learned first and L2 was learned much later, but if during the course of time, during the course of your life, your L2 has gradually become more dominant, this will show in the experiments all of which we, we will see. Language proficiency is straightforward enough that uh, which language you are better at. More often than not, we will know our L1 better than our L2. That is pretty straightforward. However, exceptions to this also uh, are, they also exist. And then third is the nature of the task, the kind of experimental task that the uh, subjects are put through, mm, bilinguals take part in on that basis also it differs. So, there are all these kinds of um, uh, parameters on which bilingual performance on working memory task can be different. Now, uh, let us uh, now move on to our main agenda in this part that is the bilingual memory models. Now, in bilingualism research for quite some time now, bilingual memory storage has been a very critical topic as we, as we have uh, started this uh, part asking where do the information go. And does it all go into one storage? Does it all does it go you know, bifurcate into two storage systems? Uh, do those two, two storage systems talk to each other or do they not? If they do talk, then what is the nature of interaction and all of that? So, that is what bilingual memory models are all about. What exactly is happening in the brain? Because these are all abstract things. There is no way you can you know see it, visualize it. There is no way to demonstrate it except uh, through indirect methods. So, there are various kinds of experimental uh, studies have taken place and on the basis of which various uh, memory, various kinds of memory models have been proposed. Uh, due to brevity of time, we cannot discuss all of them, but we will just look at the most uh, well known ones and the most uh, uh, landmark ones and also the experiments that uh, trigger them. So, these are the main questions that are needed to be uh, looked at. Now, depending on uh, how you look at it, there have been in initially starting with two different kinds of hypotheses, two main hypotheses uh, dominating the bilingual memory research. One theory says that the memory systems are shared, meaning that L1 and L2 go into the same house. So, they go to the same place. The other theory says that, other hypothesis says that the separate or independent memory hypothesis. So, interdependent versus independent, shared versus uh, separate memory. So, these are the two first two differences that were projected, that were proposed uh, way back. Now, these models are basically concerned with the concept of meaning and not the other linguistic aspects such as phonology, orthography, those things were are also now of course, uh, newer models have taken them into account, but it is when it started the idea was to check where do the concepts go. Uh, do we, you know, if uh, L1 uh, teaches us some sort of some set of concepts, L2 teaches us a separate concept, or what happens? So initially, this uh, this was the idea. 
Now, shared memory, the main points of shared memory hypothesis is that there is one memory store for both of the languages. So, you have learnt uh, let us say for a Hindi English bilingual, you have learnt the word ghar and then the word, the grapheme and the phoneme of the, of the concept is at one level, but at the conceptual level you have an idea of what ghar represents. So, when you learn English and you learn the word house, you do not need to near create a new concept for house, you already have that. So, this is what the shared memory hypothesis talks about. So, this is a language free sort of storage, language free as in this is a an objective storage system. So, whatever concepts you are gaining from language 1 and if there are overlaps, so then there is no need to learn them again. So, basically this is a sort of a concept store. So, uh, depending on uh, the various kinds of inputs you create. So, a single meaning underlying uh, both words and labels are kept. So, single concept. So, the concept representing both ghar and house are the same, right. So, this is what the shared memory hypothesis talks about. And then at the concept level this happens and then there is a kind of a tagging mechanism that identifies the words with the language at the time of retrieval. So, when we have to let us say we are uh, or when we have to comprehend one particular language or we have to speak in one particular language that concept gets tagged with the language specific uh, the word and then then that is and then the next process follows. So, this is the idea. So, the translation uh, for translation equivalence this is called translation equivalence. So, house and ghar are translation equivalence meaning they are translation of one another. So, in this case for any kind of translation equivalence only one memory uh, or conceptual uh, aspect is stored in the memory. Now, if that is the case, what would that predict? Every hypothesis would predict something, right? If this is what happens, if this then that, that is what the, that is how the, the all kinds of these theories go. So, if you have a shared memory, what should happen? So, the prediction is that because both languages are sharing the same underlying concept, they will behave the same way if there is an experimental setup to check them cross linguistically. For example, a concept learnt in one language will be transferred to the other language and one need not learn it again in the other language. Like just like the ghar and house concept I said. So, if you have let us you just heard the word ghar, your concept for ghar is um, activated and then another mo and a moment later I you hear the word house, you do not have to work very hard that concept is already there you automatically recognize the word house. So, that is what it means. So, if there is the a sing, sing, single storage in experimental setup both within language or, or and between language conditions will have same result. Now, what does this within language and between language mean we will see now. I will be talking about only a couple of uh, experiments because talking about all of them is out of uh, scope here. So, the first evidence we will talk about is a very well known study by Lopez and Young in 1974. So, the task was uh, they had used uh, Spanish English bilingual 64 of them. So, the languages were Spanish and uh, English and the task was a memory recall test, memory recall test they had to recall. Uh, certain things. So, let us let us see how it went. So, the experiment was in divided into two stages. Stage 1 is called familiarization. So, what happened in familiarization stage was they had uh, been given a list of words in English or in Spanish right and they had to look at those words and remember. Now, in stage 2 depending on text test uh, condition. Now, here comes the manipulation. This is what we have been we had just mentioned within versus between language condition. So, let us just see how it went. So, stage 1 there were Spanish word and there were English words ok. Stage 2 now there are two possibilities. Let us say you have seen only the Spanish uh, word list, you have memorized only the Spanish word list. Now, if we want to see uh, uh, within language condition, then in stage 2 you will again be given a Spanish list. If we want to check a between language condition, the same people after Spanish they will be given a, an English uh, language list. Now, the task was the, the ok, there is another list. So, this uh, second list and they have to say whether 
this list contains words from the previous list. So, that is why it is called the memory recall test. Now, if that is the test, so the second list does the second list contain words from the first list, simple task, simple memory task. So, for control or as we call fillers, there were also words that were not part of the first list, simple, very simple task. Now, the manipulation was here. So, Spanish, English here and Spanish versus English here. So, four conditions, Spanish, 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 English, 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 Spanish. Okay. So, there are two between language and two within language condition. The result showed that language familiarization, if the language familiarization was in English and test language was Spanish, the percentage of recall was higher in case of familiar words and uh, which was in, com in comparison with the control condition, control condition as in when these words were not part of. So, whether it was English or it was Spanish, the words were translation equivalent. So, if they had seen words in Spanish like let us say a word like casa in Spanish which means house and then they will see house in English, this also facilitated. So, even if they do not see casa in the next list, they see a house, this was also reacted to very fast compared to uh, recall was much higher. Similarly, Spanish English, Spanish Spanish and English English all the pairs. So, basically all the four pairs showed the same kind of result, meaning whether the word was present in the same language or when the word was present in different languages, in both cases the recall was faster, right. So, what this means is that both in within language or in uh, between language condition there was no difference, right. That means what? That means there is a shared conceptual store. So, you are seeing casa basically has activated the house and then when, so when you see house it does not really matter, you do not have to go anywhere else. The concept is already there for you to uh, say that it is ok, I have, I have seen this, right. So, this is what is about, all about the shared hypothesis. Another study also, it is again a very well known study by Karamaza, 1980. This task was a semantic categorization task. So, semantic categorization tasks are typically of this type. So, you, you are shown an object either in image or as a, as a word and then there is another word and asked whether they belong to the same category or not. It is very simple. So, you see um, a flower and then you see a rose and then you are shown flower. So, does rose belong to the category flowers? That kind of a task is called semantic categorization task. So, they had again the same kind of within language versus between language condition and um, stage 1 again there were two stages, stage 1 was uh, participants were shown Spanish English, again this was a Spanish English bilingual study. So, Spanish English word representing a category, so furniture is a category, a category is that uh, storage, that mental conceptualization which includes a lot of members. So, category furniture would include tables, chair, bed, you know, uh, cupboard and all of these things. So, that is why it is called a category name. Each category has many members in, in span, they had both uh, Spanish and English uh, words representing categories. On the stage 2 was uh, which was immediately followed by an instance of a member of the category. So, if you have seen furniture then bed appears or uh, if you see mobiles you, you see uh, kama and so on. So, again the same kind of manipulation just like the previous study. So, they had uh, Spanish words, Spanish category name, Spanish uh, member, English category name, English uh, category member and on the other, other way also. So, within language and between language conditions, the task was to give a true false answer. It was a key press study. So, you give a true, a true or false answer by pressing a key as to whether the second was a member of the previous word. So, whether bed is a member of the category furniture, it is yes. So, you press one key, if it is no, then you press another key. So, naturally the fillers were all the no answer type. So, you see furniture and then um, a word like tree comes in. So, you have to press no, there is another key. So, keys are always uh, customized. Reaction time was measured, RT for stands for reaction time. So, reaction time was measured and results showed lesser reaction time in case of a match. Uh, for both within and between language conditions. So, that is crucial finding that whether it was within language or it was between language in both cases the reaction time was smaller just like 
the previous study. So, this kind of studies gave a lot of support to the shared memory hypothesis, shared memory as in shared memory of the conceptual storage. Now, these are the findings. Now, let us move on to separate memory. Separate memory as the name suggests this proposes a memory organization where a bilingual two languages are stored in two different places okay, and they are independent of each other. There is no uh, dependency, there is no connection between these two storage systems. So, where one language information is not available to the other. Till now what we have seen is that one language information is made available to the other. How do we know that? We know that by seeing the facilitation across language between language conditions. So, if you have seen uh, furniture in uh, English and you see uh, comma in Spanish, even that facilitates. But the separate memory hypothesis says that there is no such facilitation possible. Bilinguals two languages have two different storage systems and they do not talk to each other. Okay. Now, only interaction that happens happens at the lower node that is in the translation process at the lexical level not at the conceptual level. Now, this, this memory this uh, separate memory hypothesis would predict a very different result with respect to the within and between language conditions. Within language, what do you expect? We expect that if you believe if you if separate memory hypothesis is correct, then within language conditions will facilitate, but between language conditions there will be there will be no facilitation. So they are because they don't uh, they don't they don't they are independent of each other. Evidence for this also comes from um, another study. So uh, Scarborough's famous one, this particular uh, 1984 study, they copied, they did a similar study, like Lopez and Young study, um, and they did a primed lexical decision experiment. Lexical decision experiments are uh, simple experiments where um, a letter string appears. So, few letters are put together uh, on the screen and the subject, the participant has to decide whether this is a, um, a word in that particular language. It can be English, it can be Spanish, any other language. So, for example, um, let us say um, this is a word in English language, but if you say if I write like this, um, uh, this if I write uh, like let us say I do not know whether a word exists like this, but let us hypothetically say this is not a word. So, this will be a non word, this is the word and this is called a non word. Technically, they are called non words. So, lexical decision task typically will have words and non words uh, appearing on the screen, and the task is to uh, say whether they are, they are they, this is a word, very simple uh, task. Now, this was also a Spanish English bilingual uh, study, and uh, bilinguals made lexical decision on a series of Spanish and English words and non words, right, on English words and non words general findings showed that in this study they are the similar kind of thing. So, English and Spanish uh, both English and Spanish were used. So, if you have if you have seen English first there will be uh, they found within language priming effect. So, if you have if your first stage you did a lexical decision uh, task on English and then followed by another task on English there was a lot of facilitation. But if uh, two parts one part had Spanish another part had English then there was no priming effect. So, one, one language did not help processing the other language that is what the finding general finding is this unlike the previous one previous ones we see that there is a lot of facilitation. So, language 1 facilitates processing in language 2 which does not happen here. There are many other were many other sentence processing studies also and they all showed similar kind of result that language 1 does not help in language 2 processing. Now, this sounds quite uh, interesting because uh, two kinds of uh, findings, there are mixed results. How can both be correct? So, one way of explaining this was um, by uh, talking about the task demands, uh, again a very uh, important uh, work. 
So, so they said that the differences that we see is because of the kind of task that was given to the subjects. It is not because of anything else but about what for task demands. So for example, in case of free recall task, they are saying when you are recalling, free recalling there is no bondage of language lexical aspect of the word, then you are more free and then you are automatically going to semantic and conceptual processes. And these is yielded results consistent with the shared hypothesis. However, when the task were dependent on the lexical aspect of language, then we see a separate hypothesis, a proof for separate hypothesis. So what happens here? There are two kinds of task, one dependent on the conceptual aspect of language, some conceptual semantic, um, this kind of uh, aspect of the language, if that is the task, then we see a lot of uh, shared hypothesis uh, proof. And if it is uh, based on lexical level, then we see separate hypothesis proof. Now this explains why similar studies using, however using different methods will uh, result into different kinds of findings. So that sort of um, uh, this proof to Scarborough's versus Lopez finding. To summarize, now we see that conceptually driven task depend on shared memory and lexically de depend on the uh, separate memory hypothesis. Now these findings point to the fact that both the hypotheses are correct. That is the most important take home lesson from all of these different types of findings that both can be correct at the same time because these are there are two different levels of processing that is happening. Now there are there are uh, conceptual level processing and there are lexical level processing. So this is the most crucial finding out of all of these. So there the interaction, now how do they interact, how do the lexical level and the conceptual level interact is what is the matter of hierarchical models in bilingual language processing research. Hierarchical model why? So they start with the basic assumption that bilinguals organize their knowledge of language in two at two levels, conceptual level and lexical level. So general conceptual level is one and the lexical level is the other level. So this is because there are two levels and uh, these two levels are distinct from one another, hence these models are called hierarchical model. Another important aspect of hierarchical models is that, that L1 lexicon is larger than the L2 lexicon, right. So what does it mean? It means that uh, irrespective of the language pair, in, uh, it is most common to find that the vocabulary that we have in our first language is much higher than the vocabulary storage we have in our second language. So these are two interesting foundational things about hierarchical models. One, that conceptual level and lexical level are different and two, that lexicons are uh, not the, of the same size. Now there are various models, one of the oldest is called word association model or WM uh, in short. Now this model talks about a, store, a memory structure where two languages interact at the lexical level, okay. The language, bilinguals, two languages, how do they interact? They interact at the word level, lexical level and this is based on translation equivalence. Now according to this model, words from ones L2 are directly related to words in L1 and then because the L2 cannot access the conceptual storage directly. So let us uh, see this in a pic through pictorial method. So this is why your L1, this has, this is much larger, the lexicon is larger as we have tried to show by different sizes. So L2 has a smaller vocabulary that is the first thing. Now this is the lexical level the, uh, and this is the conceptual level. Right. Now conceptual level is not accessible, this is not possible. L2 cannot access the conceptual level directly. This model says that L2 words are connected to L1 words through translation and then from L1 one has to access the conceptual level. There is no connection between L2 and conceptual level possible. 
Another possibility is that what is called concept mediation model. Concept mediation model says that L1 and L2 both have access, direct access to the conceptual store and the words are as a result not related, not related interlingually. Again, uh, we will see how this works. So, here you see there is no connection here this connection does not exist. However, this both these and this, this and this are possible. So, L1 also can uh, connect to conceptual storage, L2 can also connect. So, this uh, both of these are attributed to Potter et al uh, study. And in order to find out what exactly happens to test these two hypotheses, uh, they conducted two experiments. Um, this is the most well known of the work 1984. This study was done on Chinese English uh, bilinguals. There were two tasks, one was called picture naming, the other is translation task. Well, what happens in a picture naming task is there is there will be a number of um, uh, pictures. Now, these pictures are not uh, like photographs, they are line drawings. So, only the outline of the object will be there. So, a very rudimentary uh, sort of a picture will be there. Right, so these pictures will have to be named. So you see the picture of a house, you call it a house if, if it is English language. Uh, so this is a production study because you are speaking out, right. So this is picture naming study. So picture naming study, what happens in picture naming studies because when you are presented with a picture, there is no language specific information that you are activating, right. You are seeing the picture of a house, uh, the way house is written H-O-U-S-E or the how it sounds, nothing, none of that, that information is there. So, the picture goes, takes you directly to the conceptual storage, right. So, then the task was to just to uh, name them. Now, the participants were required to name pictures in their L2, in this case English. What do you think would happen if Chinese English bilinguals are speaking in their English language and they are naming pictures? Now, in case of word association model, it should take a lot of time. Lot of time, why? Because the language output language is L2. So, from L2 he has to go to L1 and then from there he has to go to the concept, right? It is a long way. So, concepts or in this case it was a picture, so it is the other way around. So, concept to L1, L1 to L2. This should take considerably long time. So, that is a one task. Another task was translation task. Participants were required to translate words from L1 to L2, right. So, this is a simple task. You see an L1 word and you have to translate to L2. But and this model, the first model, word association model would predict a shorter time because that line, that model says the connections exist at the lexical level. That is a interlingual, so the languages are connected at the lexical level. So, if they are connected at the lexical level, the translation should happen very rapidly. But any task that requires them to, uh, them, them, them to uh, connect to the conceptual storage will take longer, right. So, as far as uh, uh, word association model is concerned, this the uh, first task should let take longer, second task should take shorter, but concept mediation model predicts similar time for both tasks because they are supposed to be both the languages are connected at the concept uh, with the conceptual storage. The results showed that the participants showed no difference in naming and translation task whether they are high proficient bilingual or low proficient bilingual. So, irrespective of proficiency, the results were similar. So, thus this seems to prove that there is the conceptual storage is connected with both languages. So, thus proving the concept mediation model. However, there are other findings that do not quite agree. One example is Crowell and Stewart 1992, they, uh, they said that the word association model is that, that these two models are actually looking at a bilingual's proficiency at different points in time, at different uh, different points in the continuum, right. So, this is a word association model or the WM is a bilingual at early stage and CM model is basically a bilingual when he has attained a certain level of proficiency. 
This is almost uh, this, if we just sit back and think, this sounds like common sense. When we are beginning to learn a second language, we automatically, we without this, this happens almost unconsciously. We translate from one language to another and then go back. So, Apple, this is, uh, you know, this is safe, Apple is safe and then you know already what safe means and so on. So, that is exactly what Kroll um, proposed that the both models can be correct if we take proficiency into account. Another important finding was also that bilinguals translate faster from L2 to L1 rather than from L1 to L2. The reason is that uh, this is how the language acquisition often happens. So we learn L2 through our L1, so we can translate, come back to L1 and then we understand. So keeping these things in mind, revised hierarchical model was proposed by Kroll and Stewart. This is revised hierarchical model. This is sort of a combination of uh, WM and CM. So in this model, they say that languages are connected at both the conceptual level and at the lexical level. So there is a lexical connection between L1 and L2. And now um, the L2 to L1 connection is uh, stronger compared to the L1 to L2. So the connection between L, uh, L2 to L1 is stronger because we often learn our L2 through translating uh, to back to L1. However, L1 to L2, uh, this connection is weaker. This is how we mark weaker connection. Similarly, uh, L1 is connected to um, concepts in a stronger way. Uh, L2 is also connected but in a slightly weaker way. So this allows for a combination of WM and CM, but and they say that as proficiency goes higher in, in L2, this connection also can become a straight line. This can also become a strong connection. So, all, so basically this model says that languages are connected at both lexical and conceptual level. How uh, strong the connection is, is a matter of, is a factor of proficiency. So this is what basically means. So it is bidirectional connection, it is, the connection happens both way and this is something we have already said L2 to L1 is stronger and so on. And um, conceptual store and lexicon are connected via conceptual link and so on. So uh, even though the bilingual as he goes higher in his proficiency in L2, the connections between L2 to conceptual storage might uh, might get quite strong, much, much stronger than before. However, theoretically it is believed that it will probably always remain weaker compared to the L1 link. So that was revised hierarchical model and that is something that is relevant even today. It is one of the most well known and most um, cited models and a lot of work has uh, taken place within that, uh, uh, in that paradigm. Another important model that also uh, that, that came in, uh, in in similar vein was is called distributed conceptual feature model. This is also a, a model that talks about lexical and conceptual level and their connections. However, it is a slightly more nuanced in the sense that it describes how the conceptual store may be represented even at the word level. So earlier models talked about a very nice and neat distinction between conceptual and word level. This model says that some amount of conceptual representation is present at the word level as well. So as a result, if there are feature overlaps between across languages, between languages, that will mean similarity. And if there are lack of overlap, then there is no, then the similarity will disappear. So basically then languages will be different. Uh, for example, one example that they give is that of cognates. Now what are cognates? Cognates are those words that have the similar form and meaning across two languages. So those are cognates. Right. So this is a, uh, a representation of the model which was proposed by uh, Degroote in 1992. So this is how then they look at the connections. So this, there are three categories of uh, words here. The first one is that of concrete uh, words, second one is that of uh, abstract word and this is a cognate. So you see in case of cognates, there is a complete overlap for a, for a word. So any word in L1 is also the same, exact same uh, as in it is L2. 
So, it more often than not these will be concrete words because concrete words refer to concrete objects right. So, there are um, chances are very high that the concept of house and concept and the word casa they go back to the same conceptual story in the same kind of uh, mental representation as to what they represent as to what it is. However, less overlap typically are found in case of abstract ideas. So, uh, one example that they have given is that of amour and love. So, in English language the entire gamut of usage of this word is not replicated one to one on Spanish. For example, there are various examples that, the, that they have given that there are so many types of uh, cases where the word love can be utilized, but in Spanish that does not allow. Spanish does not allow the exact type of usage that English word love allows. So, that is what they mean by a much shorter, much smaller domain of overlap and that is what so features. Features are represented in the words. So, each word has a set of features and depending on how many let us say there are 1, 2, 3, 4 features and there are only overlap in uh, these then there is uh, two cases then there is uh, the there they are not too similar. But in case of these two words casa and house the overlaps are on both four features let us say and that is why we call it similar. So, um, evidence the, from this uh, for this theory comes from what is called concreteness effect experiments where concrete words are uh, found to be processed faster than abstract words because concrete words refer to concrete things and then hence they are uh, much uh, easier to process across uh, two different languages. Another model that has been very influential, uh, the BIA model, bilingual interactive activation model. The, there is a BIA plus also, which has been, which was is an updated version of BIA. Uh, we will not get into all the details, but roughly, the um, BIA basically is a network model. Okay, so it has it is slightly uh, different from RHM because this talks about an integrated storage of bilingual um, lexicon. This is basically a computer model sort of a model and um, this net, this is a network model and it uh, takes into account various things like features, letter, word, moving on to language level. So, there are all these kinds of interactions that are possible and they are activated simultaneously and para in, in parallel way. Uh, that is why this kind of uh, models are called connectionist models or parallel distributed models. What influential model? So, basically what happens is that language input, this is uh, BIA is uh, specifically designed for visual word recognition. So, when the input is visual, when we see a word. So, what happens when we see a word, this is what, this is how the representation looks. This is how BIA uh, looks basically this as I said this is a connectionist model. So, there are various, um, so you see the input starts from here, this is where the visual input is and they talk about the input in terms of first, first uh, level is uh, that of feature. For example, the letter A, letter A has this is A and this has features like this, this is one forward slash and then there is this kind of a dash sort of a thing and then there is a backward slash. These are the features of the, the letter A, right. So, visual input breaks it down to features and then there are all various kinds of uh, positions. So, which position in the word they appear. Now, this as a result, this will activate all the A's in different positions in the word. So, this will inhibit the O's let us say. Similarly, if there is a, uh, dis there is a, a display like uh, which includes the uh, uh, letter P. So, it has a straight line and there is a sort of a hook sort of a thing. So, this, this these are the features and then these features will integrate into the possible uh, letters and those letters again will uh, take us to the word level. What are the words and where all these uh, letters can appear and then this gradually it will move up finally to the language node level. So, this is basically about um, and at every level you see there are in there is interaction right. So, these are positions and so on. So, uh, feature level to letter level to word to language level this is what the BIA and a BIA plus is slightly different, but uh, basic uh, basic uh, architecture is the same. 
there is yet another model um, that, that this is in short called Blinks bilingual language interpretation interaction network for comprehension model both of these are comprehension model by the way both BIA, BIA plus and Blinks they are all comprehension models there are also production models we will talk about this uh, later uh, in more detail when we uh, discuss experimental work. So, this is another uh, comprehension model, but here this is based on auditory language comprehension. The previous one was on uh, visual word recognition, visual processing and this is about auditory processing. So, this is also a connectionist model and uh, in this model interconnected, again this is interconnected uh, levels of uh, representation and processing that are created during uh, using dynamic and self-organizing maps. So, this is um, again this also works bidirectionally and within each level both language specific and shared representations are allowed. So, you say gradually as we have moved from uh, shared versus uh, this one that so many other things are also being taken into account. So, this is uh, auditory input this, this in this case the processing starts here and as it moves to phonological level and then visual input is also taken into account. Um, that this this also mentions the McGurk effect. We will not get into it now. And then in the next level, it goes to phonological and lexical level, and then orthographic lexical information are also coming into the picture. So in in all cases, you see this is bidirectional, this is bidirectional, and this is bidirectional. So a lot of uh, interconnected, uh, dynamic, um, self-organized kind of a ma manner in which the this model is supposed to work. And uh, so basically at the end of all of these um, what have we finally what is the take home lesson is that first and foremost the studies on the bilingual memory storage has come a long way. Starting with the very fundamental very uh, uh, as many have called it under specified. So, in the initial stages they were very general you know, under specified sort of models like they are either shared or they are separate uh, there are two different kinds of memory systems. And then there are then we have seen a lot of newer models and uh, that have um, you know, shaped this domain after this from this point onwards. So, we could discuss only a few however, there are many other uh, uh, models uh, most important among them uh, better known ones are bilingual dual code theory and then SOM, SOMBIP inhibitory control hypothesis adaptive control hypothesis and so on. We will try and uh, bring them back uh, uh, when we discuss about processing later on bilingual language processing, uh, but um, so we are not discussing them here. So, from the initial models which were mostly at the general level to uh, today when we have models that talk about at every level what happens what and what kind of interaction happens between different levels. So, starting from features to words to uh, phonological information, orthographic information and how each of these nodes interact with each other they have now being uh, looked at. So, at present uh, as, it's, as things stand today mostly the hierarchical models are considered the uh, clearest um, ways of looking at what happens, what, what is uh, that exact true nature of uh, bilingual memory storage. So, this includes the RHM and also the model proposed by De Groot. These are the ones that are uh, most commonly cited ones. So, this is where we will come to an end to this part of bilingual memory storage. Um, however, we must remember that a lot of work is still going on and this is still as we say under construction. Uh, but as, as things stand today, most mostly cited examples, most cited models are that of uh, Kroll and De Groot. Thank you. Mm -hmm.